So welcome to this uh, little insight into inflorescence with me, Liz Dillnot Johnson. I'm the composer and I've got the wonderful Kyle Horch, who is the saxophonist who commissioned this piece quite a while ago. And we're going to have a little conversation about how that worked for me as a composer, for Kyle as a performer. And we're very excited to share this new CD release, which is called Inflorescence. Great. Hi, Kyle. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Let's talk about the title, Inflorescence. Okay. Um, and I mean, what, what, so this, you actually called the whole CD Inflorescence, and that's yeah. the name of my piece too. Well, well, the idea behind that project was that I wanted to record quite a number of works that were mostly written for me over the last 30 years, which is, you know, the time I've been really active as a performer. And I definitely, definitely wanted to include your piece in this because I think that's one of the really important pieces that's been written for me. Um, and I felt that the title Inflorescence, which when you wrote the piece was a completely new word for me. Um, uh, uh, and then having learned what it means uh, that it has, it's the flowering part of a, a plant, but also another definition is that it's the process of blossoming. Mm. And I feel like in a way, um, what I'm presenting in this recording are new blooms in repertoire over the last 30 years that I've been a part of through doing uh, these works and through working with composers like yourself that that's actually helped me blossom a little bit as a creative person. And um, so I, it just felt like a really nice title. Where so. the piece stems from is a, an amazing long book length poem called Crag Inspector by the poet David Hart and my beautiful treasured copy here uh, conjures up this wild landscape of the Welsh island uh, called Bardsey Island and in this poem he describes a poet in this wild landscape and he's often asking questions of the flowers. Uh, he's obviously feeling quite isolated, it's a fascinating fascinating work and, um, and I knew David Hart quite well and worked together with him and what I wanted to do with this piece was to do a little cameo of each flower that I'd chosen and then I was looking for a word that ties this kind of blossoming or the blooming or the, the shape of a flower, the, the, the kind of like the jizz of a bird, <laughs> you know, the kind of what it is, how it, how it forms itself. And um, so that's where I discovered the word inflorescence, which is exactly as you said, describes the, the flowering aspect of any plant, which is a beautiful word. And also like the poet himself, trying to find out what his shape is in this world. One thing that I was interested in is that inflorescence as a word, actually, I don't believe appears in the poem itself. Um, um, and it was, it's a word that you kind of found that was uh, uh, alongside the poem. Yeah, researching words around flowers. And so a lot of my work, I do a lot of kind of background research to do. So I'm, I'm looking up, you know, lots of information books about, about each plant that I'm looking at and, and drawing it and finding it in the, out in my own local environs and kind of getting really getting into the feel of each flower or each plant and then that uh that whole process of research then fed into the the way that I composed the music um I found the sketch the original sketches so I've got all these Fantastic. handwritten sketches so it's basically there's a sheet per flower so there's uh, handwritten sketches of of just kind of finding that kind of feel for each flower and each flower is kind of quite distinctly presented uh, in a sequence. There's a thistle which is very spiky, there's a, um, a stone crop which kind of crawls, creeps and crawls and then it's kind of quite peppery and these starburst, little tiny starburst flowers. There's a long silverweed section I, I remember and which is beautifully drawn I think. You don't only refer to flowers but you also re refer to other aspects like the slate of mm -hmm. the mountainsides and um, I feel yeah. that that's also a part of what you write. Yes yeah, so the slate element um, I was a bit worried that it was going to be all a bit too not saccharine but too sweet or too 
flowery and I want it to have a hard edge because the poem has hard edges and soft edges. Uh, so I wanted to have this hard element. So we actually, the first thing we hear is the slate, um, which is very abrasive, sharp, hard. Uh, it's kind of in your face. It's There's no give, it's just boom. Uh, there, are, I mean, there's so many different threads running through this piece, aren't there? The, the other thing that I'm reminded of is the beautiful hymn that is mentioned in the poem, which is a Welsh hymn called Oh Yesi Mawr, Oh Sweet Jesus. It's a theme through the poem where sometimes it provides solace, sometimes it's the subject of a nightmare where Oh Yesi Mawr is dripping down the walls and tormenting the poet. There's a kind of um, hidden references to Oyesi oh, Mauer. Slate actually takes the first kind of shape of, of the melody. Um, so it's like taking this beautiful, gentle hymn and turning it into this rock. And then it's kind of sometimes heard very, very quietly in one of the instruments. So um, obviously this is a piece for saxophone and piano. I don't think we mentioned the piano yet, but anyway, <laughs> it's a very important element. And um, the, the piano quite often will just play these very, very simple, quiet cluster, uh, building clusters, which are again, kind of mapping the shape of the melody. We never actually hear that melody. It's kind of quite, it's, it's a bit of a cipher, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, hidden code for those of us who know. And I would say that the pianist on the album, Anya Fadina, is a really wonderful pianist and she did a really fantastic job, I think. Oh, yeah, it's so poetic. Her her performance is just, I mean, both of you, the whole thing is so nuanced. Uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful. I, I've literally last night heard the final edits. So I'm so excited about that being released out into the world. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. So well done to you and to Anya, it's fantastic. Thank you. Well, it's just brilliant to play the piece. I absolutely love this piece. And um, I'm so glad to have it be a central work in this program, really. Go on. I was gonna ask you, have you actually been to Bardsey Island yourself? No, not yet. So this is on my list of things I need to do. I've studied maps. I mean, I've been there. <laughs> psychically <laughs> many times um but it is um a place that one can visit and and uh, reading up about it a little bit myself um in the process of working on this piece over the last 10 or 12 years is that um it was a place of christian pilgrimage in the middle ages it was actually a rather important uh, place with a monastery on it and um there's a uh, it, there's there's a little bit of a Birmingham connection in this piece because you and David uh, met, I believe, in Birmingham. He did, uh, yeah. He lived in Birmingham in King's Heath, yeah. But was he from Aberystwyth or had a connection to Aberystwyth, right? Yeah, so he grew up in Aberystwyth, which I think he could probably, certainly he could see the island. You know, it was, it was a, I think he said that his geography teacher had promised them a trip to Bardsey Island and it never happened as a, when he was a schoolboy. So he always had this kind of like <gasps> Bardsey Island. And then what happened is he had a poet, poet residency there and spent one or two weeks there really just to, to write um, something. He didn't know what he was going to write and, and Crag Inspector emerged out of that residency. That name of that poem, um, comes from a photograph that was taken. So at the front of the book, there's this little holiday snap that he took of a, a little kind of like a tiny bus shelter type thing on the cliff. And <laughs> just like in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it's just, I don't know what it, maybe some kind of lookout thing from the Second World War. I just don't know what it what it is, but uh, somebody had kind of graffitied over the, over the door, Crag Inspector, um, and that's where the title came from. His relationship with, his religious faith was complicated and deep and there's a lot of references to hymns and, and prayers and and things running through the poem and and, and this sense of pilgrimage and at the uh, as you say it was it was the, the a pilgrimage destination to go to Bardsey. There's a there's a professor of history at Birmingham University called David Gange 
who has written a book called um, The Frayed Atlantic Edge, where he does a lot of kayaking off the western coasts of uh, British and Irish uh, coastlines. And he visits Bardsey, and there's a long chapter devoted to being on Bardsey. And he, he writes very powerfully about the kind of feeling of ancientness in Bardsey and the, the literally that there are so many um, monks and so forth buried there that, that often bones rise to the surface. And so there's a feeling of um, uh, things bubbling up from the past. For the poem, I feel that, that David in writing the poem is sort of exploring himself, exploring the past. And that I think you and your music, you really respond to that. And there's something very haunting about the present and the past being mixed together. And somehow that there's an acceptance and a resolution at the end of the piece and at the end of the poem, it's not exactly concluded and wrapped up, but there's a feeling of coming together of those things that I think is really powerful. Yeah, there's a, there is a sense of some kind of resolution. It's not a full resolution. And in the piece, I wanted to give that sense of it being, we know it's the end. <laughs> Whether it's a fully kind of, um, I don't know quite how to describe it in words, but anyway, you have to listen to the piece. Um, but it's very much about, so the, the, the piece divides into two, two parts. The first part which is longer is called The Flowers and the second part is called The Poet and so the second part is very much the voice of the poet and in fact the saxophone is speaking poetry so it's, there's moments where you're just kind of chanting on one I'm just on one pitch and I was very pleased to discover which lines you you kind of say because I was thinking, I can't remember, I wonder if it's in my sketch. So the, the line, the line that you quote is, the island is a woman waiting at the edge of the world. The sky is a trowel ready to scoop up souls. When the woman sings to tell time to give them up. So that's what you kind of utter at the end. Although again, it's, nobody knows that. <laughs> It's not written into the score or anything, but well, that's, that, that's really interesting to know because, like, I one of my questions that I had written down to ask you here was: were, were there particular things you found inspiring about the poem? I mean, obviously, there were flowers that were mentioned that you've used as kind of you've picked on those things as um, kind of pillars for the piece. But I, I think there's something much deeper there that you found inspiring and and those words obviously meant something and you've set them in a way i mean i remember when we started talking about this piece which would have been i mean i finished it in 2011 but i think we've been talking about it for quite a while before that hadn't we so well i i think the thing was that i had done a previous project where we had used your music i had a group at the time the flotilla quartet where we had recorded your piece ovos and then you had actually expanded on that for live performances and so we'd been working together and also we worked separately um, because we were working a lot together uh, under the auspices of Birmingham Contemporary Music Group doing outreach projects. So we were seeing quite a lot of each other. Oh, I remember it kind of hatching in, in, a, in a kind of rather grotty staff room somewhere in South Birmingham, kind of <laughs> over a packed lunch. You know, we were kind of chewing on sandwiches and, and going, oh, 
oh, maybe we should do something. <laughs> and you, I remember you saying, I want to really, like a classical piece, I want a big piece, but just for one instrument, no changing of saxophones, just for one instrument. So I said, oh, well, what would you prefer? And you did choose the soprano saxophone. That was your choice, I believe. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. I, I don't remember that, but uh... <laughs> you may be cursing that choice, but I don't know. It sounds absolutely so beautiful. I play a Selmer Mark VI, which is a kind of legendary type of instrument on uh, on the soprano. There's something special about you know in the way it responds um, and the sound that it kind of makes, and I've never transferred on to a more modern instrument, which makes it a little bit ergonomically harder to play, and it lacks. My instrument goes up to an F, and um, most instruments go up to F sharp or even G now, uh, in terms of what's considered to be the normal range. And I can play higher than that, but I have to go into this other register called the harmonic register to do it. And uh, But in spite of the kind of challenges of it, I, I still prefer that instrument. Well, what I love about it is the, it's, I mean, it's just such a pure, beautiful sound, and the dynamic range seems really really vast you, you kind of take us from every <laughs> every level of the spectrum and uh, the piece does play on a lot of dynamic contrasts and moves through these different phases of, of energy um uh there's another flower called self-heal which i thought was particularly kind of poignant for for us all as humans of finding our ways to heal ourselves and that that for me, writing this kind of music, I find very a cathartic process. I find it very healing and very nourishing. Where did you record the disc? We rec recorded it at the Menuhin Hall, which is um, the main recital and concert hall at the Menuhin School in Cobham, Surrey. Yeah, I know that the acoustics sound so beautiful and the piano is absolutely gorgeous as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a really first class place to do a concert or to do a recording. And I knew what results you could get out of being there. And I knew the piano would be really satisfying for Annie to play on. And so I don't know if you wanted to talk about this at any length, but, you know, you've talked about being inspired by David's poetry and, and, um, and you've turned that into something that's really, really special as music, but, but there's a kind of alchemy there. And I just wonder if you want to comment on how that works as a composer for you you know how do you turn that inspiration you've taken from his poetry into such a fantastic piece i well <laughs> <laughs> i don't really know it's a feels a bit like magic <laughs> so all i do i just as i mentioned before i kind of immerse myself into whatever it is i'm working on. So I, I generally, as a composer, almost always have an external source for the music. So in this case, we've got the poem and the flowers. And so my working practice is to just really get those, all those things really kind of deeply actually embodied in my body, my spirit, my my mind, my my thinking, my every. So I just kind of really absorb all the information I can and reading the Poem. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to hear the whole disc. I think you'll like it. Yeah. I think I will. I think I will. <laughs> 